This is not another econ podcast. I'm Ian Kaneshiro. Small businesses struggle with this every day, despite offering high quality products. Sales end up being lackluster, buried under pages of similar items when customers search for them on the Amazon marketplace. And in order to succeed, Amazon sellers must be determined to stand out. They need to find ways to capture the attention of the consumer. And as sellers master this process, they will ultimately see an increase in sales. But the truth of the matter is, is that it is really difficult to go at it alone with no experience. And so today's guest is Jordi Ordonez, who is a seasoned Amazon seller and consultant based out of sunny Barcelona, working as a consultant and lecturer and teacher with some of the largest companies on the planet, such as Orange and Adidas, and also Amazon sellers of all sizes. So Jordi, I want to thank you for being with us today. Thanks a lot. And I have to say you are the first English speaker pronouncing my surname <laughs> as it is. It's Ordonez, but you don't have the N sound. So I'm usually Jordi Ordonez and you did the N. I'm a California boy. I'm an LA boy. So uh, we have a bit of the Spanish influence. And also, you know, I, I don't think we've spoken about this, Jordi, but, you know, I did a study abroad semester in Bilbao. So I struggled through Banish 101, but the NBA, yeah, and Basque, but the NBA is something that I did learn. So uh, we're all good there. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So Jordi, is there anything else that you would like us, our audience to know about you before we kind of jump into the topic of the day? On my professional side or my personal side? Whatever you'd like to share. <laughs> well, on my professional side, I'm reselling on Amazon. And I'm helping Amazon sellers and Amazon vendors. Most of them are from Spain. I'm helping them as a consultant. So what I do is read the data and give them some advice to, you know, make more money. Or let's just put it that way. On my personal side, I have two kids. I have a wife. I have a dog. I love horror movies. I love music, mostly heavy metal. And I'm teaching my kid to be a metalhead as well. So he's now playing drums. He likes Megadeth, System of a Down, Metallica, and we are playing together, which is great. You know, for a nerd like me, a metal nerd like me, it's great to see your offspring turning into the <laughs> the great heavy metal world. So, Absolutely. I'm sure your neighbors are loving that. The drums Absolutely. That yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I just have these neighbors next door and she's house deaf. So it's okay. But the guy upstairs, yeah, he hates us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's okay. It's not your problem. So, you know, Jordi, going back to the professional side for a second, you know, the Amazon reselling business, you know, I speak to a lot of sellers and, you know, you and I have been working together for years, but, you know, I speak to a lot of sellers, most of whom are based in the North American marketplaces, selling in the U.S., Canada, Mexico. Can you tell us what your experience is like kind of doing the reselling thing in Spain and in, in Europe? It's tough. It's not as easy as in the U.S., because you don't have these mom and pop stores or clearance corners on Walmart or Costco or whatever. You do have malls, but the offers are really, well, they are not that cheap. Not enough to have a big margin reselling on Amazon. So what I mostly do is reselling stuff that it's not on Amazon. That's supermarket stuff, but brands that are not still selling on Amazon. So that's the easiest way I found to stand out on the platform, but if you are reselling in Europe, it's much more complicated than the US. I see all these arbitrage courses and everybody, you know, showing big numbers like 1 million, 2 million reselling stuff from Walmart in mm. mom and pop stores. That's nearly impossible, at least in Spain. I don't know about the rest of Europe, but in Spain, I mean, those numbers are huge. So in for Spanish resellers, do they tend to be more on like a, using a wholesale formula, making connections with wholesalers to grab that inventory rather than the arbitrage side? 
Yeah, sometimes you just start reselling and then you move to wholesaling, but that's another level. So, uh, so usually wholesalers are selling on Amazon. So it's a little bit tough to compete against them because you won't have their prices. Yeah, I'll just keep it on reselling for now, not wholesaling. And most of the people I know are keeping it that way because moving to wholesale means investing a lot of money and you don't have the amount of let's say credit companies you can find on the UK or the US and it's tough to you know get money especially to escalate a business like buying and reselling nobody understands that business in Spain you know so it's tough to get money from banks or credit companies for uh, escalating those business and why do you think that is why is Spain behind the ball on this we've always been at the end of the line when it comes to e-commerce or new tech. So it's usual. I mean, if you live in Spain, you know how it works, you know how the game is played. So you just look for alternatives. Like, well, we have Waveflyer, or we used to have another company called Ritmo. They understand how an e-commerce or an Amazon business works. They have API connections to connect with your seller central, your Shopify, your adult e-commerce store or whatever, pull out the numbers and and give you a, an amount of money. But traditional banks, they don't know how an e-commerce company operates. For them, it's just magic. I know it's 2024 and they should know how it works, but we are still really, really um, behind other countries. Interesting. And so there are a lot of solutions out there that speak to the niche of Amazon and e-commerce sellers, especially from the financial standpoint. You know, there's specific banks and credit cards that are that operate both in North America and Europe that will provide that kind of funding. And, you know, I get that the traditional ways of, you know, getting money in order to scale businesses might not be there in Spain, but it's interesting to me that there isn't those alternatives. But Or if there is, it might be not as well known or the money's a lot smaller. Yeah. I think that it's a cultural and educational problem in Spain because we have people taking money from banks, taking credits to invest in cryptocurrencies without knowing anything about cryptos, you know? So that's the level, the <laughs> educational level when it comes to financials in Spain. So when it comes to banks, it's not better, you know? So sometimes when you try to go to a bank and convince the guy that you need a credit to scale your Amazon business or your e-commerce business, they don't know how it works, you know. I mean, you can present an, a report on your PL on Amazon and tell the guy, yeah, I need 10K or 20K for this because he won't understand what the business is about. Right. So you have to show that the business is viable in the beginning. So that means doing all the hard work without those outside resources. And then once you have done that work and being successful, then you can go to the bank and try to do that. Yeah, but it's easier with companies such as Wayflyer because they understand the business and they have the money, they have the resources to pull your numbers and understand the numbers better than you and just 24 or 48 hours and you got the money. I mean, right. I don't have any affiliation with them, but sure, it's great that you have these alternatives because if you need to, you know, try to make someone and a classic guy understand that you are selling online, reselling stuff from the supermarket and then reselling it on Amazon for a profit. I mean, it will explode their brains. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's what it boils down to is being able to show the value and to show that you know what you're doing. Because, But if you know the people on the other side are not ready for it, they're not ready. And it's hard to change those minds. It's tough. Because you are selling on it day by day and you understand that, well, Amazon is doing 6,000 million a year in Spain. That's the revenue. So yeah. they are pretty well known. Everybody buys on Amazon, but for um, classical financial um, firms, it's a still a mystery, you know? Yeah. So they don't rely that this is going to last for five or 10 years. So they are not giving away the money. Interesting. Jordi, do you know if, you know how, in, I know in North America, the inventory and the revenue from Amazon's marketplace is the majority third-party sellers. You know, it's over 50%. Is that the same in Spain as well? Yeah, yeah. It's both. More or less the same numbers, yes. 
And the reason I ask is because, you know, I am always talking to sellers, you know, from all around the world. And a lot of times the ones who operate in Europe are often feel like they're being kind of sandbagged from Amazon themselves, so to speak, meaning that there are a lot of, you know, regulations and problems selling on the platform that you don't necessarily get when you're in North America. And to be fair, you know, the size of like the European sales on Amazon versus North America, there is a big difference. And then you're dealing with like these individual countries that all have, you know, their own rules and regulations and tax laws, even though the majority of them operate within the EU that has overlap. What are some of the main problems that we see from sellers who are selling in Spain specifically and in the EU? And like, how do we overcome them? I would say the main pro of selling in the EU is that you have lots of countries. I mean, from your seller central in Spain, from your uh, Spanish account, you can sell in France, Germany, UK, Italy, Belgium. I don't know. Oh, it's like, well, more than seven, nine countries. Right. So that's a great thing. But the problem is that every country has its own taxes and its own regulations and Maybe you can sell an, an item in Spain and you can sell it in Germany because the regulation is different. For example, if you're on the um, vitamins and supplements niche, that's really tough, especially when it comes to regulations in Europe or even Amazon itself, because for some keywords, you can't use those keywords on your listing or you get deactivated. And that's for good. I mean, you can write a plan of action because that specific keyword triggered some regulation and, and it's a local regulation for Amazon France or Amazon Italy or whatever, and they just close your listing for good. So you can right. sell the item in Spain or maybe in Spain and I don't know, UK, but not in France, Italy and Germany. And then you have these regulations for France and Germany. It's called the um, extended regulation. It's called the ERP. I can't remember the meaning um, of the three letters. It was extended regulation from the seller or whatever. But you need to legally register for France and Germany in order to sell on those countries. And then you have different taxes in every country of Europe. So it's a mess when you uh, need to file the, um, the VAT every three months. So that's why we have some tools like Tax2 or HelloTax or Accountly just to help you with that because... It's a mess. If you're not a professional when it comes to regulations, pads or whatever, it's really hard for you to present the numbers. So that's, I think that's a main problem when you're selling Europe. Is handling the regulations and then the VAT on top of that. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, you know, Amazon, I think they say they want to, and they try to provide, you know, ways of helping sellers you know, sell across these borders with and without that registration. And whether it's like through EFN or Pan EU or one of their many programs, you end up paying for it in the long run. And it really cuts into the mm. margins. And also, you know, which means that the ultimately those prices have to be passed on to the consumer. And that makes it really difficult for sellers to compete with a lot of some of the more localized websites and e-commerce marketplaces, individual countries. And I know that tends to be a problem as well. It's a nightmare, actually. I, I've realized it when I am training new um, sellers, especially for new sellers. That's so because you have the performance, the advertising, the, the regulations, then the taxes, then the commissions and this fee and that fee and blah, blah, blah. And Sometimes you just feel you need a PhD to sell on Amazon, especially in Europe, because you have, well, maybe you know how to sell in Spain, but then you want to open your France, your France operations, and then the regulation is different, the numbers are different, the CPCs are different. You start with, um, from scratch with your seller feedback, because you have different seller feedback accounts for every different country in Europe. And sometimes, yeah, it feels like it's really difficult and well, it's costing you more money as long as you go and it's costing you more time and more, you need to, you know, like stay up to date almost every week because yes. you have new stuff going on all the time. I mean, it's exciting at one point because you never got bored, but sometimes it's just a big chaos and you just try to deal with it 
while trying to get your numbers right. Totally. Yeah, I think, you know, a little bit about what you're talking about reminds me of this saying, you know, Sellers app we work with, you know, we work in terms of helping sellers get the buy box and we need to price independently in each marketplace. But the problem with repricing in the marketplace is that Amazon makes every single marketplace share the same repricing limit, share the same amount of feeds. You know, we can send up to 30 feeds an hour, one feed every two minutes, but that is shared between all, whatever it is, seven or eight different marketplaces, different marketplaces, meaning that I'm allocating repricing feeds for my biggest marketplaces, which is generally like, you know, UK, France, Spain, and Germany. I have to split my feeds all amongst them. And then also for Poland and Sweden, which almost makes no money for me. So then we have to end up making choices about turning down the amount of repricing we do in one place and turning it up in the other. And it just creates this problem because it means that there's going to be times where we're not as competitive in certain aspects where we should be. And so it's quite the challenge from the technical standpoint, I think as well. And I think Amazon just sometimes misses the ball on that. Yeah. And how do you deal with that? I mean, how can you manage that if you are reselling and you have 1,000 SKUs, mm -hmm. which means that if you're selling in eight countries, it's 8,000 SKUs. 8,000, right. And you're repricing 8,000 SKUs. Right. I mean, that's crazy. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy you can't stay in control. You might know this better than high, but they do this thing where they kind of like will put your item as a competitor in a different country. So let's say I have all my inventory in the UK. Mm -hmm. What they'll do is they'll put that item in Germany, even though I might not be VAT registered in Germany. And what they essentially do is that they're buying that item from you in the UK and <laughs> they handle the logistics of Germany and everything, right? But what happens is sometimes we see that. And so I'll have a listing in Germany and I'm competing essentially against myself because Amazon is putting it there. You know, I don't know the regulations behind it, but it's crazy to me. And, you know, I know that sometimes it's a setting and... You know, if you can spread your inventory out and make more sales, more sales is good, but it just makes the managing of pricing and repricing much more difficult. Sometimes it's just more easy to, you know, close operations and move on <laughs> or focus on your own e-commerce store. Or if you're a U.S. seller, you have Walmart, TikTok shop, Temu, you know, we don't have a solid alternative, at least in Spain. You have big market places in Europe, such as, so you have C discount in France, or you have El Corte Inglés or Carrefour in France and Spain, and you have vertical marketplaces, Decathlon, Leroy Marlin, Mano Mano, but there isn't a solid alternative against Amazon in every single country. When it comes to Poland, maybe, well, yeah, you have Allegro, or when it comes to Romania, you have Romania, sorry, um, you have IMAC. If you're selling fashion and apparel, you have Zalando or ASOS, but there is no solid alternative to a horizontal marketplace like Amazon, because it, I told you they're doing 6,000 million a year in Spain, and if you can compete against that, so you have to sell on Amazon and that's it. And so when you are coaching, like with that being said, when you're coaching people like these new sellers on Amazon. Are you suggesting that they look for alternative streams? Like, because, you know, it sounds like there's the same problem that if Amazon turns you off for whatever reason, you're screwed. But, you know, if your only other option is one of these smaller marketplaces, is it worth it? You know, is it worth it to still have those alternative places to sell? Yeah, well, it's always a long tail, depending on your category. When it comes to um, tools and, well, home and garden, you have more alternatives, but if you're selling a um, multi-category, well, you need to sell on Amazon and you know that's going to take 60 or 70% of your revenue just for the number of clients that they have on the revenue. But I always advise to, you know, just look for all the channels, whatever channel. I mean, if you can diversify, that's a better alternative than putting all your effort and money in just one place. Because if your account shuts down or the fees change, or there's a new guy coming to town with better pricings, or even Amazon using their white brands is competing against you, you're screwed, yeah. basically. Out of curiosity, does the kind of localized Shopify stores do well and spend? Yeah, they do, they do. 
especially the ones that focus their uh, brand awareness in social channels such mm -hmm. as Instagram and TikTok. And they're doing great, actually. They're doing so great that they are even promoting stuff on Twitter. I mean, how weird is that? <laughs> because I've never saw a single e-commerce conversion coming from Twitter to my clients. But yeah, they are trying every social channel. And Instagram and TikTok is working great for e-commerce brands in Spain, at least in Spain. I think that the rest of Europe and for the US as well. Yeah, I think that one of the interesting things about a lot of the European countries is that, and I'm sure that you see this of sellers, I'm talking more of like kind of the medium and large probably more traditional, you know, brick and mortar retailers. Mm -hmm. This is probably a poor example, and you're going to tell me I'm wrong, but I'm going to run with this idea. In Spain and throughout Europe, but in Spain, they're, they're really big is like Intersport, which is a sporting goods retailer, right? They used to be my clients. And they used to be your clients. So, yeah, you know, Intersport historically has been a brick and mortar store, but mm -hmm. in, you know, in today's day and age, everybody has to move into the e-commerce side. And I'm making assumptions here, but I'm sure that their intersport.com, .es, whatever, their main website probably drives a lot of traffic because their brand is so well known and probably rivals the sporting goods sales on Amazon to a certain extent. And I think that this is something that's really unique because, you know, Spain isn't a small country, but it's small enough where like these companies still operate as like with you know, multiple branches in every major city all over the country and they're well known mm -hmm. and it provides an opportunity for them to, you know, continue to reach customers in a variety of ways. Yeah. Which is super interesting. It's amazing, but selling multi-brands is still doing great, at least in Spain, especially if you have physical stores because, well, we have great weather. So people love to take a walk and shopping, you know, shopping is a culture here, but not just on the weekends, every day. Because you you leave your work at 5 p.m. And what do you do? I mean, if you don't have kids, because I stay on, well, I spend time on the playgrounds. But if you don't, you only have two options, which is shopping or drinking beers. Which right. is, well, <laughs> it's or, both. A, or both. Yeah, actually, you can combine both because most of the malls have pubs and cinemas or whatever. So shopping is, is a solid culture in Spain. So that's why... The classical stores are doing great. Actually, during COVID, e-commerce numbers were so high in Spain. I mean, like in the rest of the world. But when the lockdowns came to an end, everyone was hitting the physical stores and the pubs. So yeah. there wasn't any money on the online business. Yeah. I wonder, you know, from a cultural standpoint, that's a super interesting, you know, thing to think about. Because, you know, you're saying that, you know, that you spend the time that you're not working at the playground with your kids. Well, but oftentimes because I have two you're, kids, yeah. Right, because you have two kids, but oftentimes you're walking there. And so, you know, who has a lot of the purchasing power in any society? It's like these working, like kind of young families that are, mm -hmm. you know, out and about, right? Like kids are expensive because they, why are they expensive? Because they need stuff. Mm -hmm. And where do you get the stuff? You get the stuff from shopping. It's either e-commerce or brick and mortar. It's your two options. And if you have the... You know, the fact that it's so ingrained in the Spanish culture is really interesting and an interesting insight. And I guess what the question being like, then why is e-commerce so, e-commerce is just still the way to go? Like, are people, do we find that people in the cities are doing less e-commerce and people kind of outside of like the major metropolitan areas are doing more of the online buying? Is that generally how it's going? No, well, not in Barcelona. I mean, well, not in Spain, as far as right. I know, but especially not in Barcelona, because most of the people is buying online, and then it's buying online categories like fashion and apparel and groceries, home and garden. I mean, e-commerce numbers are still big, but if you have to choose between e-commerce or hitting the shops, I mean, nine out of ten people prefer hitting the shops because it's a social thing. The social thing, you meet your friends or you meet your family, you go shopping with your mom and pop, or you go shopping with your friends, then you take a coffee or take a beer, or maybe yeah. you go to the movies or whatever, then it's a social thing, at least in Spain. That is a largely underrated take that I wholeheartedly agree with. Running errands with, you know, your friends and family just to kill an afternoon is 
so underrated, you know, in college, someone would be like, I need to go to the hardware store, even after college. Like some, a friend goes, I need to go to a hardware store now. And the only place that has it is, you know, this place that is, you know, 30 minutes away by car. And, you know, it seems out of the way, but I think for me, like I'm down to do that. That's so <laughs> fun. Cause then you get to spend some time with your friend in the car. And it's not just about picking up the thing from the hardware store. You kind of like walk around you touch things, you grab a bite and it's severely underrated and something that we're probably missing out. You know, we're missing out on as every, as things move more and more towards e-commerce. It's our world. You know, we, you and I, our livelihoods are based on e-commerce, but it's so funny that like, we'd love to go and, you know, touch stuff and buy stuff and just be out. It's silly, but I'm just a classical guy. Yeah. You know, I prefer to watch things live and mm -hmm. touch them, you know, before buying them. And it's weird because I work on online and I'm advising clients, I'm selling in the only commerce stores on Amazon, but I'm just this classical guy, you know. It's a do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> well, I always buy online, but just certain categories. For instance, I mean, I've never bought a guitar online. Never. Right. I mean, I couldn't do that. Mostly because I'm left-handed, so I need to try them at the proper store and then buy them. Maybe I try them on the physical store and then buy it online. I don't know because I've never done that before. But I like to go there, you know, see the showroom, smell the wood <laughs> of the guitars and, you know, just play them to see if they are, you have this feeling, you know, like picking up the guitar and inspiring you. You can have that online. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a different kind of, you know, thought process. You know, musical instruments and I can't, whole i can't play i don't play zero musical instruments but i could imagine that you know there's like a feeling a sensation when you're picking up the right thing it's like putting on the right pair of pants yeah yeah there is a connection the last guitar i bought actually had this online store selling guitars and one of my suppliers was four blocks away so i just visited them and he had four or five like handed guitars and i was like nah, man i need to play all of them because I'm not walking away of this store without buying a guitar, a new guitar. I need a new one. And I had this connection to, um, it's called a Court. It's a, well, it's not a well-known brand, but it's solid instruments. I just played four different models. And there was this one, the M600. It was just made for me, you know? Yeah, like a glove. Yeah, it inspired me to write new songs. And I was like, charmed by the smell of the wood and then the guitar so i had to buy it <laughs> yeah so that's the way it works for me yeah i hear that i think that you're totally right there's just some things that you can buy online some things you can't like i know people that like buy pants online i can't do it it's just impossible you just can't but like pants are like apparel clothing big business and like how do you know how do you know if it's the right like the right waist like the right amount of bagginess or tightness. Like it just, it's beyond me that people will do it. My wife buys clothes online. Yeah. You can try them and then send them back. So you have yes. to stay with those pants, uncomfortable pants forever. Yeah, forever. You have to just live with it. You're married to it. It's part of you. <laughs> cool. Georgie, as we kind of wrap up here, I'd love to like kind of kick it back to you if you, about anything you want to add or any conclusions or final thoughts about anything that we spoke about today. Well, we haven't spoke uh, about SEO. And one thing I recommend, I always recommend that, is to read A9 patents, whether they are on Google patents or there's this site called, it's not well known, it's called Amazon.science. And sometimes you can read papers on experiments related to A9 or new innovations that a group of scientists is trying to do for A9 or for um, the AI new uh, tools that Amazon is developing. And I like to read them because sometimes some of those papers will be applied to the uh, actual algorithm. So it's always nice to read them so you can stay ahead of what's going on the um, headquarters of the guys, the scientists that are thinking, how can they sell more stuff to you or your clients? Okay. Yeah, I think that there is the whole... You know, it's actually really interesting. I recently had a talk about 
the difference between uh, is selling on Amazon an art and a science? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the qu it's a loaded question because it's both. There's the scientific part, which is, you know, being able to understand the data, testing things and making, you know, database decisions. But then there's the art form that is, you know, reading between the lines, understanding, try to understanding industry trend, trends based off of anecdotal data and, and our own, you know, personal observations. I'm really glad that you brought that up. Yeah, it's funny because as long as you have data, you feel that you are pretty confident with your decisions. But at the end of the day, people are people. So yeah. <laughs> they are absolutely random. So you can base your decisions on data, but at the end of the day, they're just people. They're just people. They don't behave like your data says sometimes. Right. Right. Which is the whole conversation. We're running a little bit long here, so I'll, I'll close it out. But this has a whole conversation about, you know, in marketing, you know, everything that we're doing is a partially marketing. And oftentimes I like to argue that sometimes data takes the creative out of creative. When we're trying to market something, we have a new product. We're trying to push something to the end consumer. And we try to use data to make these decisions. A, B test. This is what's working. This what is it. And we try to use SEO and we're like, these are the things that are, these are the keywords that we have to use in order to get people to hit. But what that ends up doing is it takes a creative out of creative. So I think that there's, you know, a really delicate balance in being able to, you know, help use data to help make those decisions, but then also allow the creative side to flow in order to be successful. Another reason to go shopping. I mean, looking at your real users, real behaviors and random behaviors. Amen. Most definitely. And then you can and really, you know, because people are predictable, but also unpredictable at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Jordy, thank you so much for taking the time. And to all of our listeners, thank you for making it this long and listening to, I hope you learned something from Jordy about selling in the EU and in Spain and some of the, the intricacies and cultural differences about, you know, shopping in within Spain itself between brick and mortar and e-commerce. Hmm. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and we'll catch you next time on Not Another Ecom Podcast. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. See you. Take care. Bye.